Lately, there has been pushback against the notion that China is committing human rights abuses toward ethnic Muslims, particularly Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang province. And I've been curious as to why there seems to be this orchestrated effort to deny the human rights abuses. Now, well, on one hand, it's certainly true that nefarious figures like former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will cite these human rights abuses to escalate war rhetoric toward China. It's also true that the human rights abuses are happening. You can acknowledge that without advocating for war with China. An interesting piece written in New Lines magazine actually tracks the financial part of this story. The money behind some of the denialism that you may have come across. The piece is titled The Big Business of Uyghur Genocide Denial. A New Lines investigation reveals a network of charities funneling millions into left wing platforms that take Beijing's side on the genocide allegations and they're all connected to an American tech magnate. Now in the piece, the writers note that over the past five years, almost $65 million has filtered through various entities connected with people who have defended the Chinese government and downplayed or denied documented human rights violations committed by Beijing against Uyghur and Turkic Muslim minorities. And there is a specific figure who cited in this piece. The funding has moved through a complex series of mostly tax deductible investments or investment funds and charities all linked by virtue of their governance structures to one man, the 67 year old American tech magnate, Neville Roy Singham. Here to talk to me about this story is one of the writers of the piece, Alexander Reed Ross, he is a PhD. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right and senior data analyst at the Network Contagion Research Institute. Um, Alexander, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. So there's a lot in this piece and I wanna get to as much of it as possible. Uh, starting with what I would argue is um, you know, an important piece of context before we you know, get into the details. Uh, you know, It's referred to as the Uyghur genocide. What evidence is there that this genocide is in fact happening? And, and why is it being referred to more importantly as a genocide? There's a ton of evidence coming from official sources, from the Chinese yearbooks, coming from satellite imagery and from witness testimony. We've seen on the ground footage of these detention facilities, their guard towers. And so we understand the extent to which Uyghur birth rates have been halved over just two years. And how a million, um, over a million people have Uyghur people have been uh, moved over, arrested to, uh, and placed in these detention facilities. Their children have been removed to state facilities where their cultural uh, practices and religious identity are suppressed. Um, so yes, as a people, um, they are in a sense being destroyed. The New York Times also published a pretty big expose leaking 403 pages of internal Chinese state documents. And it outlines the forced sterilizations of Uyghur Muslims and and more. So there there is quite a bit of documentation about this. And so it was kind of puzzling to me why some people who identify on the left were all of a sudden denying that all of this was happening. So you went into the potential financial motives and the funding behind some of this. And let's start off with the main individual that you cite, Neville Roy Singham. Who is he and what what's the motivation here? Neville Roy Singham is a sort of interesting character. He comes from left wing activist scenes, but he went into tech uh, in the 90s, created his own sort of ideology called Agile and started to work with big Chinese tech companies like Huawei in um, 2001 to 2008. So he was um, kind of ingrained into a security complex there and worked with the Chinese Communist Party's um, essentially uh, uh, number one tech 
company. Um, and from there, he has established this echo chamber for disinformation. Mm-hmm. And why, why would he do that? Is it because of his ties to Huawei and the Chinese government? Well, I think that there are a number of reasons. Uh, perhaps he is very convinced that the United States is an imperialist power that can only be um, sort of uh, circumvented or dismantled through working with a, what they call a multipolar world of authoritarian governments that seek to establish their own financial and political hegemony throughout the world. And China is doing this um, through its own capital investments in multinational corporations and mass production uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, which requires this province, uh, Xinjiang, um, as a sort of a cornerstone. Um, So what he is doing is basically just securing the investments of the Chinese government. And in exchange, he's actually gotten some pretty sweet deals, it appears. Uh, with regards to his own Chinese corporation, corporations based in um, Shanghai. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, someone who's actually in a relationship with him, and that is uh, a co-founder for Code Pink, uh, a w- women's organization that has also weighed in on all of this. Uh, so Jody Evans is who I'm specifically talking about. Uh, you write in this piece that she co-founded a pro-China advocacy group and um, you also write about how it's funded. It's known as the People's Support Foundation. And you also write about just how much money this group has, uh, capitalized to a tune of $163.7 million. Uh, PSF, uh, the People's Support Foundation, which is registered in the United States as a 501c3 organization that grants its funders tax deductible status for their donations, invests heavily in corporate stocks and securities and uses, uses its revenue to disperse grants to other like-minded funds and educational projects. An unmistakable bias in favor of the Chinese government runs through the activities of PSF, which has no website. So talk to me a little bit about where all this money came from. How how did this organization with no website secure $163.7 million? So initially, uh, the PSF just was capitalized by two corporations, it appears. Uh, They're very difficult to trace, but one of them used the same tax uh, um, accountancy firm as other operations that Singham is behind. So it appears that the money did come from Singham in order to uh, then invest in a lot of uh, corporations and take the capital uh, gains. Um, take the dividends from those investments and sink them into uh, sort of uh, the, this n- international network of media and uh, education centers uh, with this pro China tilt. Um, so they're invested pretty heavily in companies like Caterpillar, Israel. Chemical uh, Corporation. They are. They don't have an ideology about where their money is invested. They're they're invested in whatever's going to bring in a sort of blue chip guarantee, I suppose. And then they use the dividends to fund various individuals or organizations that have the pro-China tilt. Can you give me some examples of of individuals or organizations they have uh, given money to? So they give money to a pan-Africanist organization that has a news site and was, I believe, embroiled in a sexual harassment scandal back in 2017. And that group has shares stories from uh, other media sites that are connected to the same individuals and leaders. They invest in uh, another fund called United Community Fund, which is also invested in the same network echo chamber of um, of genocide deniers. And so the. This stuff can be traced back to the the main individual that we talked about, right? Singham. 
Where is he getting his money from? Is it just his own personal money? Is there any evidence that he's receiving money from the Chinese government, which is then being funneled to these various organizations and individuals? Is there any evidence of that? So it looks like Singham sold his corporation that he started in 1993, ThoughtWorks, for a substantial amount of money in 2017 at the very beginning of the period where he started spending his millions across this network. So that is where the whole network really begins Mm -hmm. and it appears to coincide exactly with the increase in repression of the Uyghurs. So one of the individuals you write about is Vijay Prashad and his involvement with the Tricontinental Institute. Prashad actually went from acknowledging and condemning the treatment of ethnic Muslims in China to all of a sudden kind of changing his tune. We saw similar behavior by people like Max Blumenthal over at Gray Zone in regard to the treatment of um, you know, the rebels in Syria, which I thought was fascinating. And so I was I was curious about uh, Vijay Prashad's change of heart on this issue. What did your research find in regard to his change of heart? Like what motivated that? So you're right there. There was an interesting change of heart around 2018-2019 after Prashad walks away from his university position at Trinity College and starts this organization called the Tricontinental. Fascinatingly, just a few months ago, members of the Tricontinental showed up at a conference in Beijing about Xinjiang in a panel with um, the editor of the People's Daily, which is the main organ of the Chinese Communist Party. The entire conference had been put on uh, mutually by the think tank that Prashad is a member of and the Chinese propaganda, uh, the Chinese Communist Party propaganda organ or uh, ministry. So, you know, it does seem like he just increasingly um, entered closer and closer circles of uh, political influence in the Chinese Communist Party and his mind uh, changed on the way. So I'm curious if you think you know there are financial incentives for people to deny what's happening on the ground in China or if this is just an attempt to prevent the United States from escalating toward war with China. Which I I do think there should be some concern about the US. I mean, they have the US government certainly has a history of citing human rights abuses as if it cares about human rights abuses to kind of bolster support for various interventions. Um, And, you know, I've heard from some who argue look, there might be human rights abuses, but We don't want to give the United States the ability to cite this as a reason to invade or to do any type of intervention. How much of this is really motivated by money or how much of it is really motivated by ideology? You get what I'm saying? Absolutely, and it's hard to really parse how much influence $12 million might have on somebody. How much influence $14 million might have on a small info shop based in the garment district or something like that. So to their intentions and motives, the money has to play a pretty important role. But at the same time, I think that there is a sort of a, 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 a belief here that if we're dishonest, mm-hmm. um, if we just deflect, if we ignore what's actually happening, then we are fighting an anti-imperialist you know, struggle. And it simply doesn't work that way. So I also want to just quickly ask you about the involvement of the Goldman Sachs Philanthropy Fund and what its purpose is. Because that philanthropy fund is certainly part of this equation and it seems like it's being utilized to transfer dark money from, you know, from Singham to these various groups of people. 
Right, and it's sort of confusing because as we investigated the financial trail here, you know, going down to the nitty gritty of analyzing different signatures, uh, we um, we kind of found that everything was hiding in plain sight in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so why go through this kind of elaborate Goldman Sachs philanthropy fund dark money kind of route, which has been criticized uh, for disguising the sources of investments and donations. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but it certainly appears that you know there 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 is an effort to conceal the sources of funding um, on an international scale. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wanted to just throw up this graphic. It shows, it helps you visualize how the funds are being circulated between key organizations. This is the last graphic. And you know, the, the years that you guys looked at was 2017 through 2019, the years in which there were financial disclosures available. Um, I, I'm not sure if we have that graphic. Uh, oh, we don't. We don't have it. Okay. Well, everyone should go check out uh, this piece. Again, it's in New New Lines Magazine. The big business of Uyghur genocide denial, and in it, um, there are some helpful graphics to to help you kind of suss out how the money is being transferred, where it's being transferred to. And I, I thought that it was actually a pretty detailed piece and answered a lot of questions in my mind. Final question for you, um, Alexander. How should well meaning people handle these types of stories, right? Because I do think that it's legitimate to have concerns about the United States escalating its, its war rhetoric toward China. I think, you know, US intervention could be completely disastrous while also acknowledging human rights abuses. But how do you reconcile those two things, right? How do you acknowledge those human rights abuses while also not really wanting the United States to intervene. What do you think the possible solution can be in lieu of intervention? Well, yeah, I think that uh, there are things that the international community uh, can do to put pressure on the Chinese government in order to make life better for the people, uh, for, for um, Turkic Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. Um, but like what we can do, obviously not clamor for war or anything like any kind of great power competition or, or things like that. Um, we need to uphold internationalism and uh, universal human rights and recognize you know, that oppression is oppression wherever it is. Um, when we fight oppression in one place, then we fight it everywhere. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and explain your reporting with us. I really appreciate it.